it's the view. So, yeah. <laughs> um, th thanks for sticking around till eight o'clock for what's basically going to be a maths lecture. You, you rock hard, you people. You really are. Um, so, my talk, Apples versus Oranges, Mathematical rod Modeling in RPG Games. And yes, I've got role-playing game games, I know. For RPGs, it looks a bit weird. Sue me. Um, this is a uh, second in a series of talks I've done, basically about how game design is a mathematical process. Uh, some of you may have seen me talk about a battle computer, which I took to GCAP four years ago, for how to balance a game using maths. Um, talking here about how to balance an RPG, um, you have to use a bit of maths, you can't just go, mm, that feels right today. You have to put a bit of numbers into it. So, let's go. So yeah, I'm Dr. Mike Cooper. Many of you will know me as a um, programming teacher at AIE. Um, prior to that, I was a programmer and a little bit of a designer at Six Foot Kid um, for four years. I was lead programmer at Chrome Studio of Adelaide for five years, and senior lead programmer at Ratbag for six years or so. So I am, you know, a consumer professional and a programmer and all that. But I do want you all to know that I'm also a wild-eyed, long-haired bohemian who does things for fun. Um, when I was at Ratbag, I used the mod Freedom Force. I modded the crap out of this game. It was a role-playing game, a superhero role-playing game made in Australia. That's the one with the voice acting done by the development studio. You know, one of them doing his best Sean Connery impersonation and so on. Um, and I put together an expansion pack which added 200 powers to the game that quite frankly shot all over the official expansion when it came out, according to some people on the forums. <laughs> when I was at Chrome Studios, I got into playing City of Heroes, the superhero MMO. Those of you who worked with me there, Adam, may have noticed I spent a lot of time reading these forums when I should have been working. Um, that's nothing to do with why Chrome shut down, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I spent the time sort of on the powers and abilities and combat forum dissecting numbers with people and arguing about whether force fields were better than radiation and so on. Um, it was great. Um, when I was at Six Foot Kid, I decided I wanted to be a comic writer and artist and made Universe Gun, which I'm still doing, available in Greenlight Comics. That's all I'm going to say about that. And at AIE, I started putting together RPG rules in the spare time about a year ago, which is... Um, a role-playing game system in Unity to end all role-playing game systems. <laughs> um, so this talk, you're not really getting much of the professional in column A, you're getting the hobbyist enthusiast in column B mainly. All right, just in case anyone was expecting otherwise. So the problem I've been tackling with RPG rules is how to balance a RPG game, a role-playing game game, right? Um, these games, one of the big draws of them is you have multiple play styles. You know, a role-playing game is not about role-playing in the sense of acting, it's about stats, it's about getting plus 10 fire resistance and a plus 3 sword and gathering all these things sort of anally on your character to get the best to build. And your character may, for example, be able to tank their way through the game, like the Diablo 2 Paladin here, where their primary ability is toughness, you go through the game with 20 little minions wailing on you and you're just sort of uh, brushing them off and killing them slowly. Maybe you want to have a stealth play style where you sneak up behind people and gank them. Maybe you want to have a ranged damage one like the Amazon where you, you know, you're a glass cannon, vulnerable, but someone's going to die in the next three seconds. Could be you, could be the enemy. It's more exciting than being a tank. Being a tank's great when you come home drunk, by the way. <laughs> I'll always save my characters for, tank characters for that. You may even play support, which I really enjoy doing, running around healing people and supporting them. Each of these play styles will often have multiple sub-styles. You may have ranged damage per second being a fire blaster or an ice blaster or something else. You know, you had spear Amazons and bow Amazons and Diablo. And none of these should be better than the other. If you make a game and you're successful and everyone on the forums is saying there's no point in being anything other than a fire tank because that's twice as fast and you get more XP, you've failed as a designer. What can you do about this? Because if your game's successful, you're one lone designer. You know, maybe there's two of you if you're lucky. Um, 
going against thousands of dedicated players who are on the forums when they should be working at Chrome Studios, picking the game apart, dissecting it and so on. You have to think like them. Um, so the elements of an RPG, you've got um, like a power, a spell, an ability a character can do. Here's a shot of the Unity Inspector for my system where I've got a Firebolt power that does 8 to 12 damage, if you can read that down here, 20 meters range and so on. You might want to compare that with a Punch, which does 5 crushing damage, different damage type, also stuns the target for 5 seconds, you know, has other effects as well as just damage. You might want to compare that against Fire Breath, where it does less damage but in a cone and can do multiple targets. One that would be ideal from my position at the moment, <laughs> taking everyone out. Um, and, you know, you, you want to be able to kind of rate these powers. You know, is this too powerful? Is this not powerful enough? If this punch did zero damage, it's probably useless. If it did 100 damage, it's probably too powerful. There's a sweet spot in between. These powers do not exist in isolation either. They exist in a character class or a power set, usually where all these things are going to synergize with each other. You know, you might have a fire blast power set with a fire bolt, a little bread and butter. Um, a fire ball that will take out a big crowd of people. A fire burst that's like a spike damage with a cool down on it. Every 20 seconds you can really take out one person. Self heals, boost, etc., etc. Um, I'll just give you a quick demo of what that looks like. I've selected a power here in Unity Telekinetic Push, TK Push, which does some crushing damage, and it has an extra effect of knockback on here. So if I run the game and use that, um, say hello to Coriolis Boy, one of my characters here. Um, I'll just run up to this dude here, do a TK Push on him, and pure. it not only damages him, it knocks him back as well. Um, Animation by this man over here, Eric Atwood. Nicely done. Um, if I just stop that and say replace that knockback with stun instead. Stun, find that. These, this same power will now, instead of knocking back the target, it will... Uh, did it hit? Yep, it stunned him now. So it's got little tweeties around his head and can't move. So, you know, you've got a, a mature RPG system will have lots of different effects, lots of apples, oranges, different types of fruit you can stick on the end of the power. And your task is here, the problem I'm trying to solve is how do you compare them against each other to balance them um, without, you know, just turning it loose on a big bunch of players who then find all the exploits. So here's what dedicated players do. Now... I often say to the students that you've got to remember, don't try reading that, Alex, it's tiny. Um, you've, you, 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 you've got to remember that your players are far less invested than you are in your game. When you're making a game, you kind of get on fire, don't you, a bit? You know, like, yeah, this is the best thing ever, I'm going to make this game, and you forget that someone's going to play it on the toilet, perhaps, at the bus stop while talking to a friend, you know, with their left hand. And, um, However, sometimes players do get more obsessed than you do about your game. RPGs tend to lend themselves to this a little bit. So players will gather on forums and discuss the game. I sure used to. Um, started playing Torchlight 2 recently. I wanted to have a, a game to play on the plane while I was going back to the UK. Um, and I had a quick look on the forums there. And you've got um, Frost Mage build, comprehensive guide to the Ember Mage, update on Frost Mage build, and so on. And this is just for one character class. Um, you've got people making all these posts about what's better, what's worse, how to, what items go well with certain skills, and so on. It's pretty heavy. It doesn't stop there. Um, when I got onto the City of Heroes forums to have a look at this game, to investigate it, soon found out about the Red Tomax website. This was a player who had got a contact in the development studio, who'd slipped in some game data under the counter, and he'd published his spreadsheets online. So you weren't fit to take part in certain conversations till you'd had a look at this website and crunch the numbers. You know, otherwise it was just guesswork. Someone else went further and wrote the Hero Stats plugin, which was a little app that you could run with the game. Um, 
which would basically record your DPS and put out stats while you played the game. So people would talk on the forums about, well, I slotted this and this and this in Dark Blast and Dark Armor and went and ran a mission and Hero Stats gave me a DPS of 89.2. Then I went and did this other layout and got a DPS of 94, so that's better. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> these people are really into this. Um, and this is for a small backyard MMO. I dread to think the kind of things that World of Warcraft's got. You know, someone's probably working on an AI that plays the game for you and reduces it down to a single final result of what the best build is. Um, and yeah, God help us all when that happens. <laughs> so, um, this is what you're up against as a designer. Think of reached the end of the frightening part of the talk. Um, what can you do about this? You can think like a player, like one of these fanatics. So, you need to, number one, start off with a yardstick for measuring everything. I want to do these talks, this red exclamation mark, by the way, that means wake up. Um, that's sort of, bing, here's an important point here. So you need to come up with a basic yardstick, and the best one for these role-playing games is damage per second. You know, a combat in a role-playing game is two big bags of hit points, stand in front of each other doing this at a certain rate, so their health bars go down, and then one of them falls over and the other one wins when they hit zero. Um, and DPS will tell you how quickly that happens. It's simply the damage your power does divided by the time to use the power, how fast before you can use it again. So the time to use your power is going to be a function of the cooldown of the power. If it's got an artificial limit, you can only use it every 10 seconds. That's obviously important. Animation time, which we've got in bold, comes into it as well. I'll describe how in a minute. And the mana cost of the power. If the power costs heaps of mana to use, you can't use it all the time because you have to wait for it to recover. So the time to recover mana to use a power is the mana cost divided by your character's mana recovery. If it costs 100 mana to use this power and you recover 10 mana per second, it's only going to be 100 divided by 10, 10 seconds before you can use it again if you're starting to run low. The other time to use the power, the other thing you have to consider is the cooldown and the animation time. And the animation time can be a killer. Um, Usually what will happen, your character will do an animation when they go to do an attack, and then when they hit a certain event in that animation, the attack point, the cooldown starts and the power goes off. Right. When I started playing City of Heroes, my first character was a fire blaster. I like glass cannons. So this was, you know, a character purely devoted to damage with a special effect, the fire blaster effect of putting the character on fire, the target on fire, and doing more damage. No mitigation whatsoever. And I went on the forums and everyone was saying, oh no, Ice Blast is the best DPS set in the game. And it was like, get out of here. What were the designers smoking there? That's meant to be mainly damage with a bit of control and mitigation. You slow targets down, you freeze them solid maybe. And what it came down to was the animations. Ice Blast looked like this. Like someone ice skating, like Frozen out of the Incredibles. Fire Blast, the main bread and butter attack, looked like this. Yeah, I'm going to do it on you. I am the god of hellfire. <laughs> you know, and it took about two and a half seconds to do this. So while it was a very nice animation in its own right, and the animator had done a great job there, it actually killed the DPS of the set. Because instead of just going like an ice blast, it was sort of right. You know. Now you. And, you know... <laughs> It started to get less cool <laughs> every time you did it. So anyway, the, the main point of this slide, calculate damage per second for each power. That's a really good baseline. Um, there are, of course, damage types in these games. It's something you can't get away from. You know, a power will not just do 10 damage, it'll do 10 fire damage, or 10 mental psychic damage, or whatever. These are the ones from Freedom Force. These are the ones from my system. I've got more, I win. Um, and this is... Um, I've got a love-hate relationship with these things. Partly they're there for realism, like realism has any part in a game where you're setting fire to 200 robots, but, you know, metal robots would deflect bullets that'd be resistant to piercing, but they'd be vulnerable to electricity because they've got electrical components inside them. You know, there's this idea that players will have heaps of fun when they finally get to run to a room full of snow demons with a flamethrower and do double damage to everyone, and it'll be great. 
But of course, there's the sucky reverse thing where you run into a room full of snowmen with an ice gun. And, uh, you know, ping, 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 it takes four shots to kill everyone. Um, so that, you know, what, what I think is a good thing is it gives the player lots of little bonuses to chase, which is what these games are all about, really. You know, they're not about um, the actual combat and adventure, and they're about arranging all your character stuff and looking at the stats on the character sheet. That's the real buzz from them. So I think that's why damage types are popular. Now, how do they affect the DPS of an attack? What you've got to do is find the weighted average resistance of all opponents you're going to face and multiply by that factor. So say 10% of the enemies you're going to face take half damage from piercing attacks, but the other 90% take 100% damage, then that's only going to be 95% effective. 90 times 100% plus 10 times 50%. Um, and this is one thing practically every one of these games have played on the forums. You've got someone saying, don't take archery, don't take munitions, don't take sword fighting, piercing attacks are rubbish because everything's resistant to piercing. You know, robots, metal robots, yeah, you can't shoot them. Wooden things, yeah, bullets just get stuck in them. Energy creatures, bullets go through them. Who is resistant to piercing? Who's vulnerable to piercing? Oh, it's us. Yeah, it's those bags full of liquid that if you cut them, all the liquid comes out and you die. Um, so you really want to try to weight a damage type so they're all equally effective and maybe make human beings vulnerable to piercing if you are putting that damage type in. Otherwise, you're opening yourself up for headaches and for a very common pitfall. Um, now, you might have an attack that does damage over time. Setting people on fire is a popular thing to do in these games. I'm sorry about the violent content of this talk, actually. I tried to think, does this apply to anything else? And it's, no. I'm, I'm, I'm your virtual combat master for the evening. Um, you might set people on fire, poison them, maybe do a heal over time if you're being nice. Um, now, we can tell that 50 damage a second, 50 damage over 10 seconds spread out is not as good as 50 damage straight up. You know, if you've got a character with 50 hit points and you do this to them, fall over, done, bang, best result ever. If you do 50 damage over 10 seconds, they are kind of marked for death now, but still have 10 seconds to quail on you and might do some, do some damage to you. So my first attempt at doing that was just say damage over time costs half. Yeah, it's better than nothing. Um, you could go take each damage tick and weight it by 90% per second of delay. If that sounds a little bit com complex, I still haven't actually written this code. I looked at it the other day when I was writing this slide and thought, eh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it at the weekend. Um, but yeah, you know, da damage over time, you can compare that to damage fairly easily. They're quite similar things. Healing effects. Treat healing as damage with a negative value. Flip the sign again because you're applying it to an ally. Done. It's basically just reverse damage done to nice people. Now, we we'll get onto the apples and oranges, get onto the fruity part of the talk now. So you've got these other effects. Stuns, holds, roots, knockbacks, buffs, telekinesis, whatever. How are you going to compare them to damage? And I'm going to do this using a few techniques. Mm. This is sort of general to mathematical modeling as a whole. Um, you know, so if anyone's here who's not planning to make an RPG, you might take something of value back from this at least, if you're making another type of game. So we will start off with holds, stuns, and other measures. Mez, I think, is short for mesmerize. Um, these are basically where you can temporarily immobilize another character so they can't fight back, but it wears off. You know, instead of doing damage, aha, freeze you in a block of ice for 10 seconds. You know, stun you so you're doing the drunk walk for five seconds, that kind of thing. Damage, of course, is different. That's where, you know, the first attack might do nothing, have no effect other than make a little red bar move down, and then when you do enough of them, the character falls over forever and doesn't do, do you any more damage after that. So can we find any limits where these two things are identical? Um, this is a mathematical modeling technique. 
when you're trying to compare two different things. Are there any limits to their behavior where they actually meet up and become the same thing? Yes, there are. First of all, an attack that does zero damage is absolutely identical to an attack that stuns you for zero seconds, in that they're both completely useless. <laughs> they're both worth exactly zero. Sweet. That's one data point. If we go to the other end of the spectrum, you can have an attack that takes away all of a character's hit points. It's pretty much the same as one that stuns them for the duration of the entire fight, in that both of them completely take care of this character for good. You know, I don't know, during the rest of the fight, you could maybe sort of pick up, you know, attack them out with some damage attacks when you, while they're stunned, and they never fight back. So we've got these two sort of um, extreme data points, and you know, it's like we have two curves that are kind of different, but in the middle, and we can probably interpolate between them to come up with some sort of metric to compare these two things. So, here we go. Consider our typical targets. At this point, you can no longer just, you know, you have to start thinking how many hit points do things have in the game. Say, for example, you've got minion characters who you're going to fight who only have 20 hit points. Lieutenants who are a bit tougher and maybe have some special powers have 40 hit points. And then the average boss has got 80 hit points. You might have some mega bosses later on who've got 1,000 hit points. Eh, I'll leave them out of the equation for now. Um, so we should probably say that a stun for the entire fight, which would maybe last 30 seconds, is equivalent to, stunning a uh, to taking all the hit points off a lieutenant because they're in the middle of the range. If you equate a full fight stun to taking away all the minion's hit points, then the stun is always better. A stun can take any of these out of the fight, but it'll, the damage one will only take a minion out. If you say the stun is equivalent to taking all the boss's hit points away, the, then the stun is better. Oh, this is the other way around, I can't remember. So you pick the middle one. Pixel Lieutenant. So you can come up with some kind of rule of thumb here. A one second stun is worth 1.33 damage. Yeah. You know, just sort of pulls that number out of the air. That, that, that's not a magic number that applies to every game ever, ever. That's just an example of what you might end up with. Um, so that sort of takes care of that one. Now, you also get debuffs. Here we have an image from my system, someone in a darkness cloud where their accuracy has gone to shit because they can't see who they're fighting. So they're not held, they're not output in zero damage, they may be output in half their normal damage because they keep them missing. Maybe they're hitting some of their allies instead. Maybe they're doing reduced damage. Um, and there's an important point on this slide as well. So you can have defensive debuffs where you do, say, 20% less damage for 20 seconds or your accuracy is reduced by 15% for 10 seconds, that kind of thing. That's all sort of bread and butter RPG stuff. And what you can do, you can say you can equate doing minus 100% of damage is the same as being held. You know, we've already worked out how to measure being held or stunned. <coughs> if you've completely neutralized the character with a debuff, it's the same thing, really, more or less, and scale it from there. So if you have a debuff that reduces the target's damage by 50%, that's half the cost of a hold or a stun. You know, you, you've basically reduced their effectiveness by half. So you can measure that that way. So that little exclamation there is just remember this one. Um, you can sort of say that one effect is a part, one, one thing in a game is a partial version of another thing that you've already measured. Um, you can also have offensive debuffs, of course, where you know, you're doing minus 50% of your character's resistance to damage, so every time they get hit, they'll take more damage, reducing their ability to dodge so they get hit more often, that sort of thing. Um, and you can equate these to additional damage, actually to damage over time. You know, if, you if you're putting out 10 hit damage per second with your attacks, then a debuff that's going to double the damage for the next five seconds is effectively going to do an extra 50 damage over the next five seconds. You know, because you... Yeah, if the, the doubles damage for the next five seconds, yeah. You know, that's for five seconds where you're taking 50 hit points of damage, you'll take another 50 hit points, 
if the player keeps attacking you. Um, so that's a way of sort of um, assessing an offensive debuff. I haven't actually written the code for these yet, so I'm a bit skimpy on details. Now, what are we going to do with all these numbers? You know, you know what it's like. There's nothing better than just making up a big pile of numbers and then writing them down on a piece of paper. And you know, what what use is measuring all these things? For starters, you can put them into the game itself. The cost to upgrade a power or to buy a power. Um, Freedom Force did this. We've got um, a picture here of Liberty Lad, one of the characters in the game, um, and his energy grenade cost 1,019 points to buy. That rather arbitrary number was the result of some big equation they had in the back end, taking the damage, the energy cost, the accuracy, all that sort of thing, modifiers on the power into account. And, you know, if they'd done that all right, that would have made for a very balanced game. I think they actually had a few little mistakes in there that um, didn't, but whatever. It wasn't a multiplayer game, so it wasn't too important. What you can also do is display them in the Unity editor. This is what I'm doing. So when, I, when I'm putting together a power, you get this little summary here, giving you the damage per second, the mitigation, the benefit, and the total cost of that power. Um, when I've got a character in the game with a bunch of powers, you get this little readout here with their total cost and a sort of table of how much damage per second, mitigation and benefits each power does. And you can sort of tell as well then, is this character a support character, a damage character, a defensive character from looking at these numbers? If you get the system right. I'll, I'll just show you how that works if I stop here. So if I take this TK push power, down the bottom here, it's doing 10 crushing damage and 2 stun, so it has a DPS of 7.73 um, and a total cost of 8.49. If I up the damage, say instead of doing 10 damage it does 10 to 30 damage, you can see those numbers change in real time. So if I get a bit excited, you know, like say I'm making a lightning bolt and I think, yeah, that should stun the, t stun the character when it hits, because, you know, lightning jangles up their nervous system. And, yeah, let's put knockback on it as well, because, you know, electricity often sort of throws you around when you get hit by it. So we'll drop that in there. As, um, hang on. Two, and put stun in there as well. And, you know, I won't give it a recharge, because I hate having to wait for my powers to recharge, and I hate running out of energy, so I'll give it zero energy cost. And while you're doing this, getting all worked up, you're suddenly like, whoa, why does that cost 20 points now? Ah, maybe I should put this on cooldown. Maybe I should move the knockback to a separate power and just have this as a basic attack. So it's basically having these numbers sitting there in real time for you as a designer helps you sort of keep you honest if the system's all put together correctly. This is why I've been spending time on this um, in that way. Because there is a development overhead um, to all of this. You know, I, I could have spent the time when I was writing this system and writing this talk doing something else, doing something cool, rather than just crunching numbers, making the game work, you know. Because the players aren't going to see much of this. Um, the overhead is you have to calculate the cost for any effect you make. Um, and... <coughs> I sort of became aware of this big time when I made telekinesis as a power one day. I'll just demonstrate that. Um, I had this idea at work that you could attach an effect onto the end of a power called telekinesis, and it would find a nearby prop and throw it at the target. So you could sort of go vroom, and it would throw a chair at someone, or throw whatever was nearby, and I thought that would be wicked. Um, you know, can't wait to get home and make it. Um, so here we go, we target this dude over here, use TK throw, and it levitates an object there. Well now, I've got stunned, you'll just have to wait till I wake up. There we go, throw again, and bang, it throws that object at them. And I was like, yeah, this is brilliant. Last thing on my mind at this point is how much does this power cost? You know, I'm just sort of excited about the idea of throwing physics objects around in the game. So. I tipped the programmers there. I went and made these cost functions that I have in my status effect class abstract. What that means is you have to go and work out on the spot how much it's going to cost or the code is not going to compile. You have to put these functions in. It was just like a message to my future self. 
you know, don't ever make a status effect and forget to put the cost functions in. You can put cost functions in and just get them all to return zero and then feel really dirty about it. Um, and what I've found is it typically takes me about 10 minutes to do these. You know, it's just like a reminder. Hey, Mike, past Mike said, go and work out the cost for this thing while it's all fresh in your head, while your mind is on the power of telekinesis. Because I can't actually remember how this code works now, six weeks later or, you know, three months later or whatever. So there is a bit of a development overhead to doing all of this. But I, I think it's worth it. I think it's better than putting a game together and then at the end going, right, is this balanced? Uh, let's get some humans to test it. That's no offense to humans, but that's never going to work <laughs> too well. You know, you've got to do some hard sums instead. Um, now, it gets tricky as well. You can have conditions on an effect in, the, in a power. Like, um, here's an easy one. Say you've got a power which has a 20% chance to stun someone for five seconds. That's quite a common thing to have in these games. It doesn't reliably stun the target. You know, that it's like a punch. The main purpose is to do damage, but you might get a lucky hit and leave them reeling. How much should that cost compared to a five second stun? Any guesses? David? One second? Yeah, one, yeah. one fifth of the cost, 20% of the cost. Yeah, I'll buy that. That should cost 20% of what a five second stun that always happens should cost. Pretty easy. It sounds too easy. It does, doesn't it? Shall I make it difficult, Seb? Right. Plus 40 damage if stealthed. Say you've got the ability to turn invisible. And when you're invisible, you can do an assassin's strike. And if you're invisible, it does an extra 40 damage. So then I become visible. How much should that cost compared to just doing 40 damage? Hmm. Now, look to the limits again. If the character has no possible way of ever being stealthed, how much should that cost? Zero. It's useless. You know, if the character is permanently invisible all the time, that should cost 100% of the cost. So you sort of somewhere in between. You know, the, the model I was using when I put this one together is um, you can go invisible with a sort of on-demand toggle power. You know, I'm Batman, and you're invisible. But as soon as you attack someone, or as soon as you take a damage, that breaks. So you sort of get the lucky hit on the first target when you stealth, and then you have to scrap it out with everyone else. So about the best you can do is say, OK, typically you're going to face a lieutenant and two minions. You can creep up and gank the lieutenant, and then you have to scrap it out with the two minions. So you get to do this for about half the fight, half the hit points in the fight. 50%. Uh, 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 that'll do for now. It's really a case of context. You know, does the character have a stealth power? Do they rely on an ally to stealth them? Do they rely on environmental effects to stealth them in the game? Does stealth get broken by damage? And so on and so on. And I think that leads us to, well, not obvious how to calculate this one. Oh, and there's an invisible character about to, to gank someone. Yeah, I have actually written this one, and it's cool. I love it. Sometimes you have to go beyond theory. We've been doing what we call theory craft in here, where you sit down with a piece of paper or, you know, some uh, digital tools or whatever, a spreadsheet, and work out in theory how this character is going to perform. Um, and, you know, I, I found a bunch of old notebooks with all the City of Heroes builds and notes and so on, and it was like, wow, it's nearly unintelligible to me now. <laughs> but it brought back good memories. And what you can do is you can use in-game analytics to measure the effectiveness of each power. If you think back to that hero stats thing I talked about that someone made for City of Heroes, you can build your own little version of this to record how much damage each power is actually doing in the field. You know, how often do I manage to land a stealth strike on, a ca on another character? How often do I not get the bonus damage in a typical run, in a typical game? You know, you want to you want to be careful the conditions you do it under. Don't go into a level where everyone's got infrared vision to test the stealth strike. That's not going to end well. Um, you could, in fact, use AIs in a tournament, couldn't you? You know, build a whole bunch of characters, possibly at random, fight them against each other, leave the computer running overnight, 
and then see how everyone rated at the end and if that matched up to your expectations if some supposedly balanced characters were taking each other out at even rates or or not you know in this kind of thing you'll obviously get some um, some load, you know, loaded balance, um, loaded battles. Frosty the Snowman versus Flamethrower Man. Flamethrower Man's going to win, but you know, Flamethrower Man's then going to go against Asbestos Man as well at some point. So it should all balance out if you've got your numbers right. That, of course, is limited by how good your AI is. Does your AI know how to creep upon someone and gank them? Possibly not. Does it keep trying to do the stealth strike when it's visible? Um, you know, when it's sort of wasting its time with the long wind-up because it's not going to get the bonus damage. Or you can record a human player in a test level. You could put together a fairly neutral test level, run through it yourself with a character, play in how you play in the optimal way, and record some numbers for it. Yeah, I've still got to do that. I'm not going to do this this weekend, maybe next weekend, um, but I will do it. Um, and actually, yeah, just go back one. And if the game gets successful, of course, this is something that you really should be doing. League of Legends do it. I read an article the other day about that. How every couple of weeks, uh, you know, they've got analytics going to the web, of course, from their huge number of players. And they record all these things about which characters work well against other ones, which ones work well for beginner players versus more experienced players and so on. And they're constantly tweaking their data and putting out new patches to try and keep the game as balanced as possible. And every time they do that, the rabid player base who hang around on forums try to find a new exploit. And, you know, the real battle of League of Legends is between the developer and the players, not between all these fictional characters <laughs> in that way. So a nice bit of spin-off technology you get from this. Um, being able to describe every power as a single number and evaluate them is really good for the AI. If an AI is having to make a decision, do I shoot you or punch you or fire an arrow at you, you can basically just calculate a number for each one. Um, do these numbers, this cop sergeant is thinking a single shot against the Coriolis boys only worth 0.93 here. He could turn on his leadership toggle to buff his entire team, that's worth 12 and a half. Summoning the drones is worth zero because I think he's already summoned them. And he could kite, you know, you can put non-power behavior like kiting and moving backwards is worth zero at the moment. Yeah, he's going to turn his leadership toggles on. You know, it's, it's good for a basic utility AI system like that. With a telekinesis effect that I put together, I thought, yeah, no, I should work out how much this power costs. Uh, that's a boring thing to do. And then later on, I was playing through that, another level with that character as my AI assistant. And he started picking things up and throwing them telekinetically at the enemies by himself. And I was just like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. That's great. So, you know, it, it, it was really nice to have that as the basis for the AI in game as well. Um, but now every time I build a new power or ability, the AI just work out how to use it, as long as I've got these costs right. So to summarize, all the little bings here. Work out what you want to measure when you're comparing apples versus oranges in your game and find a base yardstick for it. For me, it was damage per second, because the kind of games I like are all about doing damage to other people. Unfortunately, I'm a bad person. I'm, you know, what do you call it, inured to it now. It just seems normal. Um, when you compare an apples to oranges, two different things, try to find the limits where they have become identical. This was like the stuns or holds and damage attacks. You know, if you take them both to zero, they're the same. If you take them to their ultimate level, they're both the same. And then you can sort of interpolate in between. Use sliding scales to evaluate partial effects. You know, debuffing someone so they're putting out half their damage is half as good as holding them completely, as mezzing them. So that's another good sort of um, technique for comparing two things. And uh, like I said, I'm sure this has applications outside of virtual combat. I just haven't thought of them. You know, possibly some sort of. I could have applied this to Band Stars or, you know, Kitty Keeper by Mighty Kingdom might have made use of it, I don't know. And 
I've said here, if modeling gets too complex, use empirical evidence like analytics. That should really be when. You know, if you're making a game, sometimes you'll make a game with very simple arithmetic behind it, often you're not. Um, so that's the point where you want to shift to also having a bit of empirical evidence to back up these calculations you're doing. You know, theory craft will take you a long way, 75% of the way to having a balanced game, but you do want to have some analytics to be able to check that your theory craft's correct in that way. Whew. Well, that was a lot of hard sums. Does anyone have any questions or observations or...? Um, I suppose, how, how in this model, how do you account for player skill? Because uh, I know... What's that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the cost involved being good at the game, I suppose. So. Um, like the tank character, you like yeah. great for being drunk. Oh, right, so yeah, the, yeah. the skill yep. ceiling might be much lower, but the floor is quite high. Hmm. How does that? That's a very good question. Yeah, because uh, I mean, my initial response was to laugh at you there. Yeah. But you know, the, the, these are the kind of games for people who don't have any dexterity, like myself. I have terrible reflexes, so I imagine that I play characters in computer games with plus twenty percent accuracy, and that sort of does the trick for me. But um. Yeah, I, I mean, League of Legends do this in their analytics. They separate and funnel between new players and players who've had the game for a long time. So, you know, the, 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 they do work out that certain characters are simple and easily, easy to play. You know, if they've got like one signature area effect move. I think, who, who plays League of Legends here? Does anyone know there's a character called Galen is there who does a sword spin? Or something. Uh, Garen. 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 Yeah, whatever. Garen Galen. Something, yeah. And he's apparently really good for beginner players. I guess because you don't need a lot of sort of dexterity yourself. Yeah, that's basically. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, Sorry, Garen. Yeah, yeah. Garen. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, um, I, I guess you could incorporate that into your analytics. In terms of the theory craft, I have no idea how you do it. Damn, you've just given me some homework there. Yeah. Alex? I, I was thinking about that problem now as well. Um, uh -huh. I, I guess you could have like a function of like how much DPS you do depending on your skill level. So if you're a, a perfect player, you get the ideal DPS. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a beginner player, maybe you'll have a significantly less DPS. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you've, if, if you've got a condition, um, like, you know, are you stealthed? You could say that a player who knows what they're doing is more likely to be stealthed at the right moment. So you could build a little skill slider into there, into the evaluation for that condition. Hmm. How do you uh, evaluate that to a person's skill level? Uh, how would you put that in? Well, you know, you, 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 I, 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 guess you'd say, I guess you'd say you can do an evaluation of this power for skill level from zero to 10. Yeah. And you know, the stealth condition becomes like a 30% penalty for a bad player, but only a 60% penalty to the cost for a good player, because the good player is really good at getting stealth at the right moment. What if you have the option to change weapons? Say you have one that lights mm -hmm. on fire, and like you said, it does 50 yep. damage over 10 seconds, but yep. if you have another one which essentially is like a piercing weapon, I'll go off ice because apparently yep. Uh, from Final Fantasy, Tifa's favourite weapons are fire and ice because they work well together. Yeah. Uh, and the ice one does 50 damage per hit. What if you combine them to do extra damage and you switch between the two? Um, are, you, are you talking here about switching between them intelligently? Like, uh, here's a room for snowman, I'm going to have my fire weapon. I'm going to get a fire weapon first while yeah. I'm on fire, and then I'm going to change and I can hit you for 50 points of damage per hit. Okay. So, um, yeah. Right. That, that would really come out in the analytics. I haven't got a theory craft way of working out power. I mean, you, you can work out like power cycles like that. You know, say, say you've got a bread and butter attack, you just firebolt, firebolt, but every 10 seconds you can go boom, fire spike, and do lots of damage with that. You can work out what's called a power rotation there, where you sort of go spike, bur bolt, bolt, spike, bolt, bolt, waltz like that and then work out the DPS of that. And I know people used to do this on these forums, and I thought, I'm going to, mm, can't be bothered. Um, yep, Ryan? 
I feel like a, a solution, especially when you're talking about things and like about combat and yeah. like games in general. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you could probably measure it against timing events. Yeah. So like uh, like if you were to try and differentiate between somebody who's perhaps not as skilled as somebody who uh -huh. is skilled, it'd probably come down to something like somebody performing a certain task okay. at the right time. Yeah, as yeah. To... You, you you could actually do that if you were working out the power rotations. Like I said, if you're a bad player, just stick half a second in between each one mm. to simulate a player who's going. <laughs> <laughs> like this, rather than... I think, doom, I think League of Legends, doom, doom. Yeah. Legends does it. Uh, okay, yeah. Like, the key difference is... Yeah. Is I mean, I, I've no idea what League of Legends do in terms of their theory behind it and any kind of, you know, if, if, if they have any sort of DPS calculators or whatever they use, or if they just rely solely on analytics. I imagine they have both. Well, pro players know to rotate yeah. their lane at exactly yeah. this time in order to get this certain yeah. effect over here, and then yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, they are doing yeah. literally. Because you know, I, I, I'm I'm trying to do both in my backyard bedroom. I assume yeah. League of Legends <laughs> are trying to do both at home. So, Chris, did you have a? Yeah, I was going to say uh, before we talking about the sort of when you get to the edge of theory, is that uh, then a case for introducing randomness? And making those sort of edges a little bit fuzzy, or is that, mm. in your mind, like a bit of a cop out? To this um, kind of I mean, I mean, I mean uh, yeah. When, well, with the theory models, you know, say you're working out how much is this 40 bonus damage, it only happens when you're stealthed worth. You could say, ah, oh, it's between random 30 to 40 percent, or whatever, sort of fuzzy. Yeah. Um, but I guess. At the end of the day, the exercise there is to come up with one definitive number for it. Um, so 30 to 40 percent really works out the same as just saying 35 percent sharp. You know, you, you're acknowledging it's an approximation um, from the get-go kind of, yeah. Does that, does that then avoid the, those players on the forums who are going crazy over trying to figure out that? Oh, right. You mean like having, having random amounts of damage? Yeah. Oh, they just work out the average. Oh yeah, they. Oh yeah, they do that in their sleep. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, Kathy. So, Dr. Mike, you're going to end up making this. Um, so, will I, as a developer, be able to get hold of that system and make my? Kathy, work? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because yeah, uh, I mean, ho hopefully, RPG rules. Um, this I've got to get a T-shirt for it. Um, will be available on the Unity Assets Store about the end of the year. That, that involve that's. Conditional, of course, on me being stealth. And that's conditional on me um, pulling my finger out of my bum and actually finishing it, um, and so on. But it'll be available on the asset store at some point. That's my idea. Yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm developing it at the moment as a teaching tool. Um, number of lectures I give on role-playing games. It's pretty good. Yeah. That was a lot of information to take in. Are you going to share the, the presentation at all? Oh, go on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll share the presentation. You, you've got somewhere where there can be. We can put them on the development. Archived. Page. Yeah, brilliant. Let's do that. Yeah. So, um, HP isn't just negative damage because it extends the duration of the fight. So, how do you take that into account in your formula? Damn. Who left it? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> right. You get yeah. this problem where everyone just becomes a sponge and no one dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, 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 if you've got overhealing going on. Um, and then on the opposite sec um, end of the spectrum, if something just kills you one hit, healing is useless. Yes. Yeah. The, 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 there are a lot of things where the basic idea of damage per second fall apart. Um, one, for example, is you know if you've got an attack that does a million damage, it's not <laughs> 10,000 times better than an attack that does 100 damage if everyone's got 80 hit points. Yeah. If you've got a healing ability that... Um, you know, like a healing aura, a passive healing aura that's making it impossible to damage a character. And I have seen games do this. I ran into one in Titan Quest the other day, man, it shattered me. Um, then, yeah, th th that's really the game's become overbalanced. I mean, I would say you can counter healing with crowd control with holes and methods. You can set up a puzzle for the player like that, where, you know, you've got a shaman in the back row healing everyone, and if you just keep trying to wail on the minions, you're going to die. But if you apply crowd control to the shaman to stop him healing, or run through the minions and go and nobble the shaman, then that works. 
but then instead of accounting for it mathematically, you sort of account for the meta game a bit more? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 these are sort of extra areas where theory breaks down, really, yeah. Um, yeah, because the original point there was that healing extends the duration of the fight. Yeah. Sometimes infinitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, so then your stun becomes mm -hmm. more effective. Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes you have to start calculating, like, um, the net damage per second. You know, um, I can do 10 damage per second to this hard target, to this boss, but they're healing at 9 damage per second. They're healing 9 damage points per second. Therefore, my DPS is actually 1. Um, I mean, I mean, City of Heroes used to have these bosses which apparently have regenerated so insanely due to a faulty patch that was applied <laughs> that you had to have a character with radiation powers to neutralize their regeneration. Right. And suddenly everyone with radiation powers was like little Mr. Popular on the, on the servers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you can overbalance your game trying to do that. Yeah. Um, so there's this one that's very great in skill powers. Yeah. If you were to go to a multiplayer system. Interactions with combinations of different skills, where applying them, the one player applies a certain skill, uses a certain skill, and then followed by another one. Another player. Are you because they couldn't do it. To, so you're talking about just the teamwork here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I guess you'd want to you you'd turn to your analytics there. Like with, with the AI tournament, the fictional AI tournament talked about, there is a great time to you know throw four AIs against four other AIs and see how effective they are. You, you really do have to do that if you're working with support characters as well, which is one of my favorite things to do, when you've got a character who can buff their team or debuff the enemies, particularly buffing their team. It's often useless so long. Um, so yeah, um, I don't have any good answers for how to do a theory craft model and actually turn to analytics there. You know, get a team of four players going in and record how well they do when they're working together as force multipliers on each other, um, yeah. I, mean, I, th I think it's really good if a game does that. You know, for example, have one character who can lay down a burning patch that enemies tend to run away from, and have another character with a root. Woohoo! Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it feels good when players help each other out like that. All right. Everyone ready to go home and write a well-balanced role-playing game? <laughs> <laughs>